Good evening and welcome to the fourth weekend of Contagion. Um, Contagion is an exhibition season organized by Science Gallery Bengaluru. Science Gallery Bengaluru is a part of an international network of nine galleries across the world. And um, it is a public institution for research-based engagement. And Contagion is our first fully online exhibition season. Integral to the exhibition season is a public lecture series. This time we have a 23 lecture series supported by the Indian National Science Academy. We are grateful to have their support. Today's lecture is on detect, investigate and diagnose configuring care in the context of Ebola and AIDS. And our speaker today is Adia Benton. Before I introduce Professor Benton, allow me to share with you our upcoming programs for tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a full day, starting at 10 a.m. with a workshop with the artist Ranjit Kangal Gaukar on drawing from the Bombay Plague, which is an archive-based, archive research-based archive research artwork. Do join in at 10 a.m. Following that, we have a quiz called Knowledge Transmission, a, a quiz on contagions by Quizmaster Tejasvi Udupa at 2 p.m. Following that, we have a discussion with the filmmaker Miriam Ghani and the cultural theorist Rashmi Soni at 5 p.m. The film Disease is available to view on our website. Do have a look at it before you uh, are able to listen to Mariam and Rashmi tomorrow evening. You can, of course, watch the film afterwards if that suits you better. Tomorrow evening's lecture is on Contagion and Electricity, Two Ways of Talking About Connection in Dance by Professor Ananya Kabir of King's College London. And that's at 6.30 PM, same time as the lecture series um, on weekends during Contagion. Adia Benton is an Associate Professor of Anthropology and African Studies at Northwestern University, where she's affiliated with the Science and Human Culture Program. She is the author of the award-winning book, HIV Exceptionalism, Development Through Disease in Sierra Leone. And she's currently writing another book about the West African Ebola outbreak. More broadly, she studies political, economic, and historical factors shaping how care is provided in complex humanitarian emergencies and in longer term development projects like those for health. Remember, during the lecture, you can put your questions in the Q&A box and do not forget to leave us your feedback because that's how we learn and that's how we'll be able to know if you're happy with the program or if you might do something better. Thank you again for being here this evening and may I welcome Atiya. Over to you. Thank you, John V. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I look forward to questions and answers. That's usually where um, I think I get the most um, traction. Today, I'm going to be talking about um, two things, uh, Ebola and AIDS, uh, particularly in Sierra Leone. And um, so this, uh, the name of this lecture actually comes from a course that I was teaching uh, for undergraduates about, this is basically a, a course about anthropological approaches to science and technology studies and the politics of knowledge production. And when I was coming up with the title for this lecture, I was trying to think of, of the modalities that are, are, I guess, really interesting uh, points of, of, of of investigation for me and the, or, or of interest in analysis to me and those are detection which is how to how do how do we as sort of health people health professionals or anthropologists social scientists recognize something as a problem so how do, how do we place the problem the second is investigation so how does one research learn more about the problem that has been detected as a problem and identified as such and the third is the diagnosis so what, what are the causes and the consequences of the problem that we have uncovered? What are the solutions um, that, that derive from that diagnosis? For this, so basically, maybe if there was a fourth part of the title, it would be something like intervene. All of these are, are the, the lecture will proceed in two parts because um, I'm, the AIDS work that I'm talking about is far behind me. I did that work between 2005 and 2007 based upon research and experience 
working in Sierra Leone in 2003 and 2004. Um, the second part will be focused on AIDS, I mean, on Ebola. Um, configurations of, of care, what I mean by that is what are the politics of care? So how is it distributed? Um, the I'm talking about the economics within that configuration. So how is it financed? And what are the social, social and cultural um, relationships between care, politics, and its, its financing? Um, so the social practices, the cultural practices undergirding those. So this first part is about AIDS, as I mentioned before, and I'm basically going to talk about a project that I started 15 years ago. So it's going. This is, you know, this is what it looks like, and this is the the thing that I find um, kind of. It's like I'm digging up an old old memories. Uh, this, this forms the basis for the book that I wrote or that was published in 2015. But that first project happened in the post conflict period in Sierra Leone. There was a civil war, I think as many of you know, especially if you watch um, movies or listen to Kanye West in the, in the aughts, but um, it's a, it was a civil war that started in 1991, ended in 2002, and most of the popular representations focused on things like child soldiers. So there are popular memoirs that emerged out of this period um, for people focused on the amputations. Um, which was the spectacular part of the violence of that civil war. And then, as I mentioned before, this movie, Blood Diamond, this, the massive displacement caused by this um, war. So there are, there's a wide range of estimates um, in terms of what happened in Sierra Leone, but the, the idea was that so a third of the population was displaced, um, 20 to 50,000 people were killed, and that had serious impact on how a range of health and development projects were both conceived, so they were usually conceived to address the problems of conflict in the post-conflict moment, but they were all, it also shaped which things became problems. And in the aftermath of this war, um, there was a lot of concern that war itself amplified HIV. Um, or amplify the transmission of HIV because of the widespread sexual violence, because of the movement of troops from high prevalence countries, um, and so on. But what we learned, so this is, this is Africa as a whole, and as you can see, um, Southern Africa had the, had the highest HIV prevalence in the continent with some smatterings in East Africa, and then as you moved west, the, the prevalence is, is considerably lower. Um, so Sierra Leone is, I should actually go back, is, is the, um, the, the red mark here. And this, these numbers were actually based upon sentinel surveillance numbers, which do not look like actual seroprevalence surveys, which are based upon sort of population-based test estimates. And I can talk about that in Q&A. But basically what HIV prevalence looked like in Sierra Leone was something more like um, distributed in points of passage in the country. And so I conducted my research in Freetown, which is the, the piece that sort of projected out of the country, which had something like 2% prevalence at the time. So what did that mean in terms of numbers? There were 50,000 people who were thought to um, be HIV positive. About 13,000 of those were seen to be in need of antiretrovirals, um, which at the time there was a, a kind of cutoff point, a threshold uh, below which you did not or above which you did not offer um, antiretroviral care. Um, by the time I was doing my research, there were about 5,000 people on the drugs. There were 16 sites distributing these ARVs um, officially. I should say officially, because once you get to the ground, you notice that there are other ways that the drugs are, are distributed. But what was interesting is these are, when I say 16, these are the, the district level facilities offering this. Um, it was free, this care, or at least the antiretrovirals were free because of money provided by the Global Fund and the World Bank. So these are kind of the numbers. 
But as an anthropologist, I was sort. This is just background information for me. Um, the reason that I know that there are there were more than sixteen distrib distribution sites is because I was on the ground, and my research questions were a bit different. Though. So I was curious not about um, this sort of just the sort of um, public health concerns, which is essentially how do you get people to change their practices so that we're not spreading the disease? How do we make sure that people um, uh, comply with the, the recommendations of HIV care? But I was really interested in who are the HIV, who are, who are HIV positive people? Like what groups do they come from? How do they affiliate? Um, what are their experiences? How do they live their lives with this particular condition which had become a chronic condition requiring a daily medication and other kinds of interventions to make the drugs work. So that was like the first thing that I was interested in. The other thing as an anthropologist, I was interested in what are the cultural meanings ascribed to AIDS in this set? So besides, um, you know, the, knowing that this is a virus and a virus causes AIDS and you have to take these drugs or this is how you prevent the virus transmitting in the first place, I was also really interested in what people thought about AIDS. And, and by people, I don't just mean Sierra Leoneans, but also the people who run these programs who kind of build up a career in doing all of this stuff along the HIV continuum, prevention, treatment, care, support. Like, what did that actually mean? What is this industry doing in this place? And I was this very basic question, how are people accessing services in Freetown? So what does it look like when you're um, accessing these kinds of services? Why do you do it? And, and what does that look like? So to be able to understand the, or to get at those questions, it requires understanding the political sort of social layout of, of, of the distribution of care. So when I was talking about configurations of care as a politics, as an e economic, situation as a social practice, knowing who the actors are is really important. So we have this local population, which is, you know, a very strange gloss, but let's go with it. And then foreign donors, multilaterals, the INGOs and the government of Sierra Leone, all working in concert with each other. Now this looks very different now, but back then this is what it sort of, what the configuration looks like. It was, foreign donors um, giving money to UN, UN agencies, UN agencies giving money to foreign, to, to, to other groups like the international NGOs, civil society, local NGOs. And those are somehow going into the local population that they identify as their targets. And then there's a small group of HIV positives who are kind of drawing in from those health and development projects. So, of course, the, when you look at the sort of political and economic arrangements, these social practices in the industry itself, you have to begin to wonder, what are the effects of bringing drugs to lots of people, putting drugs into bodies, as they used to say in the 90s and the early aughts? What is that? How does that affect all of these relations? And how does this distribution of care via pharmaceuticals shape, how does it shape its health systems? How does it shape health labor markets, consumption practices? Um, so one of the things that I ultimately found, and I should just kind of get, I'll get there eventually, but I just wanted to, to kind of foreshadow that. But one of the things that was really interesting to me was how HIV, particularly when it came to antiretroviral therapies, distorted the health system in Sierra Leone. It's a very small country. Um, modest, at the time, modest health budget for, the, for this population. And a huge amount of the money was going into HIV prevention and treatment activities. A lot of it was sort of skipping the government um, altogether. And so when I was working um, in these places, what I, at least in all these different places in Freetown, I discovered or I learned that um, some health personnel had been pulled into HIV and they were pretty bored. 
So anyway, I just wanted to foreshadow that. I'll get to that in a second. I'm doing this methods piece because I think um, a lot of people don't know what anthropologists do, or they assume that we just sort of hang around. Some, some many years ago, someone called it deep hanging out, and it's stuck. <laughs> but that sounds like you're just sitting around having beer or whatever, and that anyone can be an anthropologist. And you know what? Actually, anyone can be. But it's not simply about hanging out. It's about um, what you learn as a result of immersion. Um, what does it mean to um, to be in a place, but also pay particular attention to patterned relationships and trying to understand those in a particular way. So um, in this case, I used observation. So participation and interviewing with an emphasis on face-to-face -face, um, interaction. Um, I am the research instrument and the tool as I'm in, it's an embodied practice. And it's something that we have to think about, I think quite um, a lot, which is how do you move through space and how is your own, how is your presence, um, I guess, interpreted and analyzed by the people that you're interacting with. So these are just a few images um, from <laughs> those sites. Um, sometimes I went to support association meetings, which were held fairly regularly. I went to public events, participated and marched um, when we were talking about HIV um, positive people's rights. I visited clinics, I went to workshops and I went to official meetings. Um, the people who participated in this project were support association members, program staff, clinicians, community members, um, but I also lived in a community that was not simply about HIV. And so I was able to learn about sort of mainstream thinking about HIV, sexuality, uh, gender relations, gender norms, um, as a result of having to interact across different community sites. I'm briefly going through this because I do want you to, I want to actually compare what ended up happening with my Ebola work, which was done remotely. So newspapers, radio, I listened to the radio every single day, um, visited websites. Um, I had a hearsay and gossip journal. <laughs> so if I heard stories that, I, that were maybe not true, that I knew weren't true, I thought that those were also interesting stories, but they were also uh, official reports. So the findings for this study, and it's in the book, but I, I figured why not talk about it <laughs> as if, as if um, it was still in formation because I, a lot of the insights from this AIDS work has informed what I'm thinking about with this Ebola project, um, the book that I'm currently writing. So what I found was that AIDS was a resource um, for poor and, and I think working class families. So, I think it's a very, it was a very, one of the things that I learned was it was very different for people who were wealthy. They didn't have to seek help or, or any of their uh, resources in, in publicly financed institutions. And so often their status, often their um, reliance upon publicly funded goods was minimal. And that meant that they were not subject to many of the constraints of HIV programming. It um, affected what I was at the time, because this was the trendy theoretical situation at the time, I talked about citizenship, which is um, a lot of the writing about Africa in particular with respect to HIV and with respect to health issues more generally is that Africans don't do, they're not citizens of their country, they're citizens of therapy or citizens of um, biology or they're building up um, membership and belonging on the basis of certain kinds of conditions that were intervened upon by NGOs or government or whatever. But what I was saying was, is actually what I hear more than anything else is a desire to rethink relationships to the state, and particularly if you relied upon the state to provide certain kinds of resources, which is health infrastructure, which is um, the ability to, uh, or social, a range of social services. I also learned that there were a lot of cultural meetings ascribed to AIDS. Um, amongst the NGO community and the AIDS industry, it was a resource for them. And so perpetuating certain kinds of ideas about the need for separate HIV, vertical HIV programming, I think shaped 
how they talked about, how they related to HIV prevention, treatment and care in this community or in these communities where I worked. But all, also, the war very much shaped how people talked about this. So war changed gender norms, war changed social norms, war made people vulnerable to HIV. When in fact that didn't look to be true directly, I, I won't say that it wasn't an indirect truth. And the final piece was that the political economy of AIDS. So when I talk about AIDS as an industry, um, it became embodied. So people were very much, and I, and I say people, I mean the people that I talked to, so HIV positive people, people who worked in HIV programs, people who worked um, in peripheral but related fields, became very invested in HIV as a hustle, for lack of a better way to describe it. And it's not to say that AIDS is not an important disease experienced uh, in a significant way because of its chronic nature when you're on dr the drugs, but it's also to say that people were very much um, invested in the significance of AIDS, um, for better or worse. So my argument, which actually felt very controversial at the time, was that vertical programs distort health systems in ways that make HIV seem like it's exceptional. And when you treat it as exceptional, it becomes exceptional. It is tautology, I'm sorry, but it's something that I felt um, needed to be said as I was talking to more and more people who were ambivalent about they, they wanted to say, yes, AIDS is important. HIV is important, but I also care about other things. I want my government, I want the NGOs, I want development industries to have a broader view. We live our lives irrespective of our HIV status. So that's the sort of the point of the book. Um, I should add that after I made sort of figured all of this out, this thing became subject to debate again. So this is a picture from a 2012 debate at the um, International AIDS Society meeting where Jeffrey Sachs, Mead Over, Richard Horton, I'm naming them because they're actually all import, important figures in global AIDS stuff. So Jeffrey Sachs is an economist. Uh, Mead Over, I'm not actually sure what his uh, expertise is, but he is a well-known figure in global health. Um, was a senior fellow at the Center for Development, uh, I think Global Development in Washington, DC. And Richard Horton is the editor in chief of The Lancet. And I think he just won a human rights award. But these are people who are actively debating whether AIDS needed its own separate category. Should it continue to be exceptional? At this debate, and I, this is sort of a turning point, at this debate is a room full of, of folks who were there for the AIDS, AIDS meetings. And that's the first time it was in DC in a long time because the United States actually had a visa. Um, you had to have an HIV, HIV negative or have um, proof that you have access to um, good HIV care to be able to be issued a visa. This, this has since changed, but at the time that was a huge, um, that's what kept people from, kept them from holding the AIDS meetings in the United States. And so this was the first meeting after several years. And this room is divided. Before the debate, everyone thinks that AIDS needs to be a separate thing. It needs to be exceptional and it continues to be exceptional. At the end of this meeting, however, this debate, um, all of these actually, and that's the, that the former head of, of, of UNAIDS, Michelle de Sidibe on the other side. Um, but what, what ended up happening is half of the crowd kind of moved to the, actually maybe AIDS isn't exceptional. This has implications that I think a lot of people who are um, very much pro-vertical AIDS programs and that, and that basically is that, uh, the implication is that um, we're all worried about whether this means that AIDS will be defunded. Now that we're moving into 2030 and talking about the end of AIDS, this poses a huge problem. So how can we think about something like AIDS, something a, a disease that was discovered in the late 1970s, early 80s, um, has developed a, a fairly effective treatment and maybe a vaccine is, is down the line. 
how do we talk about um, the ending AIDS while also continuing to, um, without exceptionalizing it, but also um, attending to the specific problems posed by preventing AIDS, treating AIDS, and, and living a long life with AIDS or HIV raises lots of questions and I know. So that's what I, when I'm talking about care, I'm thinking care more globally. Um, and like I said, this is a two part, a two part piece. So I, I've, I've kind of blasted through all of this research that I did from 2006, where, well, what I would say 2003 to 2007 through 2015 when I, I published that book. And I'd started working on this project on something called global surgery which also it affected Sierra Leone because there aren't very many surgeons, um, but surgical, high surgical need. And in the midst of that research, um, the West African Ebola outbreak happened. And, you know, I'd been, so, so broadly my concerns were going from this HIV care situation where HIV was exceptionalized, I think to the detriment of people who were living with HIV, but also people who wanted care outside of that HIV vertical paradigm. I was looking at sort of an inverse issue, which is that surgery was a huge surgical, um, surgically treated conditions, um, treatable conditions were not exceptionalized and actually were needed. Um, but there was this sort of push towards that. And so I was kind of like in this, uh, I don't know what it was, chaos, like research chaos when, when Ebola happened. Um, and so I quickly switched focus because everything that I was doing was affected by this Ebola outbreak. But those big concerns, like what does it mean to develop a system of care, a system that is attentive to care and isn't just, I guess, subject to the whims of a global landscape or global donors who shape the narrative about what is important, what is significant, and what should be prioritized as a health problem. So how, what, is the, what does this look like in an emergency? So this, is, this, this part is, is um, based upon a different kind of research that was not about participant observation in Freetown at the time of the outbreak. It, it's me coming to terms with um, being an anthropologist writing an ethnographic memoir um, about things that I had to observe from afar. Um, when I could not observe an epidemic unfolding on the ground, but had to make lots of different kinds of deductive and inductive leaps on the basis of reports from people on the ground, rep um, reports, memos, um, new news reports, a range of different kinds of, of, of data sources. But I think it also forced me to, to really confront the problem of ethnography more broadly, which is that there's partial truths in any research because it is an embodied form of data collection. How do you embrace and acknowledge uh, the embodied nature of any knowledge making practice? So anyway, all of this to say, this is these are early, uh, early graphs or early depictions of what was happening with Ebola in 2014. This comes from uh, November 2014, which is what I would consider to be the, the, the sort of downswing of, of the outbreak. So the timeline here, it's, it's a bit of a confusing graph now that I'm looking at it, but the bottom is the timeline from 76 when the virus was discovered to 2014. So as you can see, there were, there are these blips. So 1976, 1979, uh, 95, 96, 2000. This was the largest outbreak. The West African outbreak was the biggest outbreak in the history of Ebola, um, which produced lots of different uh, sort of global effects. Some of which I, I can talk about um, in, in Q and A, but just to kind of point to what happened, uh, this was this was something like in Sierra Leone we have uh, a thousand a thousand deaths of four or five thousand 
cases. This grew considerably. So there are, um, I think, something like 4,000 deaths out of um, 10 or 11,000 infections in Sierra Leone. Um, there was a, another outbreak happening in Congo at the time. So just, just in case you were wondering like why that is happening, there were cases in Nigeria, Mali, Senegal, uh, they are not showing the US cases. Ebola is um, a hemorrhagic fever. Um, it is a, this is sort of the, the physiological explanation or the clinical explanation. Um, most symptoms occur between two and 21 days after exposure, but the most eight to 10 days is the most common. Um, the first stage looks a lot like other diseases that are endemic to the area, which is why it actually took quite some time before it was identified as the pathogen making people sick in um, March of 2014. It became clear by June, July that this was out of control. And um, this is sort of, these are all of the, I have so many of these pictures, it's sort of hard to, to, to pick which maps are the most effective. Um, but the origin of the outbreak is perceived to have been in Gekadu, um, which is sort of at the border of those where Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea meet. All of these countries closed their borders fairly early on to prevent the um, outbreak from spreading. This is your timeline. Please don't feel compelled to, it, it is probably the most crowded timeline I've used, but it's one of those things that allows you to see all of the, 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 the pin that can allow you to, to pinpoint the key political moves in this timeline between say January, 2014 and September. When the cases were starting, you see this exponential growth of cases. So it's around ju late June where MSF says, you know what, this is out of control. We're no longer able to keep people from dying, or actually we're no longer able to work at the capacity uh, that we have. I can talk about these specifics. So um, a few things are happening at the time. These are in August. Um, this is Freetown, actually. Um, there's uh, people were actually doing outreach, community outreach. This is from Liberia. This woman became quite famous for protecting all of the people, for caring for all the people in her household without being getting sick. Um, she ended up becoming a nursing student in Atlanta. Um, this is one of the key uh, concerns during the outbreak was how do we, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, a safe and dignified burial is what they call it. But how do you actually um, have a, a keep to local customs and rituals of grieving, mourning, and dealing with death um, in ways that don't inspire resistance? Now, I said, and I'm actually not sure that I said this, but when I was thinking through how do you bifurcate or think about Ebola and AIDS together, um, one of the things I thought would be useful was to try to think of a series of observations, not necessarily principles, but observations about the Ebola outbreak um, and other things that we saw with, with AIDS um, and cholera in Sierra Leone. But also, you know, I, I think I started to revise these as I was in the midst of what we're all in the midst of, which is this COVID-19. Um, pandemic. So these principles I will outline, again, this is something we can talk about in Q&A and we can kind of work through together. But one of the things that came up in 2014 was the militarization of the response. So the first principle, the thing that I, I started writing about was the militarization of the epidemic. The epidemic will be militarized. That's a play on the, re the revolution will not be televised. In Sierra Leone, this took on a kind of literal, this was literal. I'm not, there's no metaphor, well, there is metaphor here, but this was literal. The, um, when the Ministry of Health and Sanitation was not performing to the standards that, um, was not performing to the standards that the Minister of, that the President liked, he said, okay, we're going to switch control from the Ministry of Health and Sanitation to the Ministry of Defense. 
this meant that uh, all of the coordination, all of the emergency coordination was handled by the Ministry of Defense. The headquarters for um, the emergency response was the, air, the armed forces headquarters. But it also meant that the checkpoints were also armed, uh, manned by armed guards uh, from the military. In Sierra Leone, this wasn't necessarily always perceived as bad or strange because they had worked in the cholera, uh, the cholera epidemic a few years before. That's the first thing. But the second thing was that um, they're sort of, I guess, the most highly organized and professionalized uh, cadre of, of government workers in, in Sierra Leone. Now that, but that does raise a question, which is why and how is the military the better equipped organization to handle a health issue? That said, um, MSF for the first time, I think ever, requested military assistance. And I wrote a piece about this. I think some people might have read this, but I, I, I wrote this piece because I was curious, like how did MSF make that decision? Um, I was invited to look in their archives and kind of look at the memos and understand that. And one of the things that um, MSF did, and I think they did unsuccessfully, was to say, can we get the military that's been preparing for biosecurity problems, can we get, um, can we, can we get all of that, that sort of biosecurity slash health prep, medical clinical assist assistance without any of the military baggage, which is guns, violence, and all of that. And I don't think that those can be productively uncoupled. Um, I think it also raise, again, raises questions about why it is that we get to a situation in which the military is much better equipped to handle crisis that, of, of, a, of a health variety. What are we doing with our, like, what is, what are we paying for? What are we trying to do when this is the, the reality that we're faced with? And certain communities are not um, accepting of, armed guards in front of their mosques, in front of their clinics, and so on. And, and I think to some extent, it sort of promotes defensiveness on the parts of communities. Um, we talk about, I mentioned the war and conflict, and one of the things that comes up or came up when I started talking to people who had passed through the checkpoints, you know, I said, well, where is this? You know, I would ask, where are these checkpoints? Because um, when I worked in Sierra Leone in 2003, um, many of the checkpoints that existed were wartime checkpoints. And so these actually were remobilized during the um, outbreak. This is a picture from uh, Liberia. Um, and this is from actually from Monrovia. And I mentioned this only because um, this was a famous case. A uh, 15 year old boy was killed during these clashes. But this is one of those instances where you see how a militarized response inspires violence, right? So this was actually a situation in which they were trying to move um, suspected Ebola cases into an already marginalized community on the coast of, of Monrovia, so not Sierra Leone, in, in Liberia. And so this longer term uh, sort of, I guess, geography of blame that existed in the city was, was created, I think, more marginalization as a result of the involvement of, of, of militarized police and security. And, I, and again, I can talk about this. Um, this, you can't really, for some reason this is off, but the, um, there was, I think, a, a kind of a widespread response that critiqued or criticized this, this decision. So again, I'm not sure if anyone remembers this, but the US sent, uh, 3,000 troops to Liberia. Uh, the UK sent 1,000 troops and a few military ships to Sierra Leone. And so this is one of the cartoons that I, I have in the, in, in the chapter that I wrote. We were kind of hoping for doctors where the United States, the military is all we've got, send in drones just because. Um, this was what Liberians were talking about, uh, Obama, Obama sending 3,000 troops. Um, so, 
that's just sort of a, a, a visual of all of that. Um, the second thing was official outbreak response will be rooted in and reflect global hierarchies. Um, this looked this looks like a lot of things. So um, this is a painting from a, a Sierra Leone a Sierra Leonean artist. Um, I think his name is is Mohammed Jebi, but he was one of the things that I I find really striking about this image is how. Um, so this is obviously MS, these are MSF vehicles because the, the logo is actually on there. But you see these people are kind of in these white suits are taking folks away. Um, it almost looks like one of the people is being carried away in um, like cuffs. But basically, actually there are a lot of things to say about this picture, but one of the things that I actually um, point out is that all of the vehicles are, are have turned out towards the, the road. And so this is actually not, a strange practice of uh, sometimes people who drive SUVs will do this so they can easily exit. But one of the things that's really, um, that was striking to me when I was reading some of the French language literature, um, particularly in Guinea where uh, health workers were attacked with some, I'd say with some regularity, is they actually started to create um, these vests that could be pulled off quickly and they were told to park the cars pointing out to the roads in case they needed to make a quick escape. So it became common, at least in, in, in Guinea, when I was reading all this literature from anthropologists, is that people start, it, the, the workers who were coming to take folks would even set, see that any questions that po were posed by community members about where they were taking their um, loved one, what was going to happen to their friend or family as resistance. So any kind of questioning of what people, what, what health workers were doing, what clinicians were doing was interpreted as resistance, which also I think contributed to the um, landscape of care, or at least the landscape of defensiveness, the extent to which people perceived, uh, who, who perceived care as violent. Um, so a lot of these hierarchies that I, I talk about too are, are really um, bureaucratic and administrative categories. So when the US started to build facilities, both in, the U, uh, both in uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia, they built like one very expensive facility that was only going to um, be for expatriates before they got evacuated. Um, so there, and, th and then there were all of these other sort of paperwork situation. So how do you ensure a non full time employee? Um, how do you ensure a person who's a citizen of one country versus another, um, and ensure that they got evacuated or treated properly? All of these things mapped on to these global hierarchies. Um, and many of the decisions being made about um, who would be placed where and under what conditions were very much um, dictated along these sort of global lines. So how is care distributed? How are certain kinds of resources distributed? Through what, um, through what agencies, under what conditions? What kinds of interventions are, um, are uh, tailored for certain groups? And that, that's a theme I think that actually goes through AIDS, it goes through cholera, it goes through these things. Um, representations of crisis may be racialized and isolationist. I have a comma here. And focused on the allocation and geographies of blame. So one of the things that sort of exploded on Twitter when I was, um, basically I was getting up every morning trying to find out what is happening in Sierra Leone, what is happening in Liberia, what is happening in Guinea. And I think this was um, October, 2014. But we had this, is Ebola the ISIS of biological agents? People laughed about this, but it actually came out of a, a New York Times op-ed piece written by a person who was in the Department of Homeland Security and who was advising on health issues. He was the head of a public health school. And he was saying, if we think about Ebola as a terrorist, then we have to use anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism approaches to Ebola. Think about the implications of that. There is also this piece, uh, which was the front of Newsweek, but not every version of Newsweek, which basically equated 
um, it, it sort of did this interesting semiotic work, which Africans in particular, who were often in a position of being compared to apes, uh, well, of being compared to monkeys, actually, um, were all that this was supposed to be, a, it, the story was actually about bush meat in the United States and being the back door, the, the way that this stuff got smuggled into the US, the same kind of border protection logic um, that animalized and dehumanized African people. The international version of Newsweek looked very different. And I'm not sure what that was about. I will just say, I mean, I'm sure what it's about, but I, I guess I'll leave it to your interpretation at this point. But this was, you know, the hands together and talking about relations of care or relations of intimacy, I think is a very different kind of optic and a very different kind of, of representation. The fourth is that conspiracy theories reflect the unequal and inequitable power dynamics that we see. So um, there were a lot of conspiracy theories. I'm of the camp, and I think this is very anthropological, where I'm saying, you know, I don't know if mocking conspiracy theories is really the best approach here. Um, I think it's really important to pay attention to them because they tell us something. They tell us something. It's not always clear what they're telling, but often what they're telling us is that they're, they're usually a critique, a criticism of some kind about unequal, inequitable power dynamics and relationships. And that often affects how people will uptake, will take up certain kinds of interventions, how they will experience them, how they will interpret them. And this is, I'm speaking, you know, I'm thinking a lot about masks, masks and vaccines in the United States, but I think this one, um, this is something worth thinking about in this context. Um, I will only say here that this is in reference to uh, the loss of fever lab in Kinema, Sierra Leone, which has existed for, I think it's been, it's like 30 years old. It is um, a, a very important center for hemorrhagic fevers. And in fact, the people who worked in that lab, ran that lab, were the first people to recognize that there had been Ebola in West Africa before 2014. And not just the Ivoirian strain that was that um, the Reston virus is not, not just those, not just those, but at the similar to the Congolese strains. And so um, that they were and that they were present in Liberia, that they were present in Sierra, present in Sierra Leone before 2014, because they had a bunch of um, old samples that they had not tested for Ebola. Uh, they published those data in 2014 and many of the scientists who published those data were, died from Ebola because they were treating patients with Ebola in, in, during this outbreak. All of this to say, people were very concerned that that lab was also responsible for the spillover uh, or the outbreak in West Africa. And what ended up happening was people said, okay, so who's paying for that research to happen? Because it happens in the Kinema government hospital, which is not very good, not, it's not excellent, like this loss of fever lab, which is very excellent, to the, by the admission of the people who work in that lab. I'm not making this up, this is what they say. And um, the, 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 the lab is actually funded by the department, US Department of Defense and Tulane University in videos of community, of diaspora community uh, question and answer sessions in Washington, DC, many of the concerned community, diaspora community folks were asking CDC people, hey, can you explain what the Department of Defense and Tulane University were doing in Kenema, Sierra Leone? And is there any relationship between this outbreak and the work that they were doing in that lab? Now, I don't know if there is, <laughs> And there's lots of research that suggests that, that it isn't. However, this question is not simply about what is the cause of the outbreak, but rather what is the relationship between the Department of Defense, between this university, between the government of Sierra Leone and this, this government hospital? Raises questions about the relations of power, the movement of money and the movement of pathogens. Number five, leaders vow never again and see this as an opportunity to change.
I only, <laughs> this feels more poignant now because of what is happening with COVID-19 and our preparedness. Um, and I'm sure no one feels this more than um, the people who are watching this lecture right now. Um, but one of the, the never agains came from the United Nations. Um, they came from the World Health Organization and, and lots of other groups that said, oh, this is an opportunity. Government of Sierra Leone, we will now be more prepared. So lots of, of, of these, many of these agencies and institutions have focused on this never again, have, have built up different kinds of bureaucratic and administrative processes and practices to address future outbreaks. Um, I think it remains to be seen the extent to which these things have actually, these, these changes have affected um, the delivery of care in general, but also the prevention of epidemics. Sierra Leone actually has pretty low COVID uh, infections right now. They close their borders, they make you test when you come in through the airport. Um, I believe that there are lessons from Ebola, but I do wonder about preparation at the level of clinical care. Um, and, and that's again, another, another question and concern, it comes up a lot. It actually came up a lot in that sort of 2016 to 2019 period, which is what happens if you really improve your, your surveillance and data systems, but you haven't yet been able to scale up other aspects of your health system. So what does it mean if you have like an iPad to collect all of the, the disease data and to transmit it to, to the district or the, the national office? but you don't have gloves, you don't have um, common drugs that people need to be able to deal with the sort of everyday infections and, and, and conditions that people experience. Um, I always talk about how people support their own agendas throughout the crisis. Um, there are so many instances of this, but it certainly is always something that one needs to think about when they're crafting interventions and when they're thinking about relations of care. So what if you center care, if, agenda, if your agenda is care, what does care look like? Um, for me, currently, that meant, that meant you know, and with COVID-19 I'm talking about, uh, and I think to some extent Ebola, if your aim is to make people as comfortable to, to not drive them into debt for the sake of care, if it is to provide the most loving, affectionate care in the context of the clinic, but also to ensure that people are, can maintain their lives and their livelihoods throughout a crisis, your intervention looks very different than if it is about simply containing, isolating, and controlling infection. Um, it is very different if, if it's not about making your app the go-to app for, oh, I don't know, conferencing or <laughs> remote learning or any of those things. How people support their agendas is also, is also important to consider um, all the time. And then there's this data question and I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with it, but I'm not sure what to do with it. It's just data will always be necessary. They'll all be, always be sought after, but also unreliable and political fraud. I'm thinking specifically about the models that were created not only during Ebola, but also in say COVID-19, but it also made a difference for AIDS and HIV in Sierra Leone because those numbers that people were expecting to be off the charts because of the war were actually quite small. And so how do you um, shore up uncertainty and think about problems outside of or in relation to the forms of data that are seen as the legitimate purveyors of truth. So I just wanted to end there. I know it's abrupt, but um, those were my sort of seven principles. There are probably eight or nine more. Um, this is, um, I look forward to, to talking to everyone about this. So thank you, Adia. That was fantastic. Um, I think I, I much appreciated the clarity 
uh, of how you're able to understand the phenomenon and uh, certainly can join you in sharing with our audiences that anthropology is not deep hanging out. There's, there's more certainly, most certainly much more to it than that. And uh, we, we could see that from your work. And even for those of us uh, in the audience or amongst us who are not necessarily from the humanities and social sciences will be able to see what you've been able to parse out from your research, um, the empirical observations, especially as illustrated, the sort of astonishing and at the same time shocking similarities with what we are seeing going on around us right now um, globally, but also in India. So thank you very much for this. Let me let me start out by ask by um, looking at the questions and sharing them with you. So here's I'll, I'll start with one. Uh, really appreciated your insights in placing the placing this in the light of care and the militarization of epidemics in contexts where trust in the public health system and authorities is maybe already low, especially for vulnerable populations. How does this play up in caregiving in light of an epidemic and a pandemic? And I think that's pretty much what you spoke about. So as a care seeker, how does one know uh, if the health system or authorities have, um, how does one, you know, in a sense, assess uh, one's own interests um, in such a system? And how does one place trust and how does this affect care? Oh, that's that's actually a really excellent and I prop, a diff, difficult to answer question because I think you, to some extent, the answer is in the question, which is, <laughs> it's a really I think that's been one of the problems um, is that when it, you know I and I'm, I'll speak from the actually I'll speak in the U.S. case because there's there's actually some really wonderful. Uh, reporting about um, some of the, I'd say, more disadvantaged communities in my city. I live in Chicago. And how there were all of these people who died because they delayed care. And they delayed care because, so basically what would happen is their neighborhood health facility, they didn't trust it. And once they got to the point where they were so sick, they went to a place that they did trust out in the suburbs. It, you know, this, it took them 30, 40 minutes to get there when they're having oxygen problems, just sort of breathing. Um, and so I think that is a fundamental problem all to the, at the beginning is how do you trust your health system? If we use the Sierra Leonean case, um, some, some facilities were better trusted than others. And so you'll hear the stories that I heard from survivors um, and they're, they're kind of, um, I guess we call that survivor bias almost, <laughs> which is they were, they were early on in the epidemic, people didn't trust those health facilities and chose to, um, chose to stay home or chose to go somewhere to a different kind of healer. And it, mm -hmm. ca it caused a bunch of problems. So they started fining people um, or they, they so the, mili and the milita militarized response was not um, good <laughs> for those communities because that's also, those are the communities that are the most policed, the most um, violated by mm -hmm. these groups. And so they were seen as recalcitrant. You know, actually I'll, I'll tell a story, one of the first survivors he, and ev everyone who knows survivors in Sierra Leone knows this guy and knows this story. But I heard of it in a very bizarre way. I was sitting with these survivors, um, and two survivors who were the head of their survivors association. And they're telling me all of this like sort of wonderful, all about the wonderful work that they're doing, reaching out to people in rural areas who don't have access to care, even though it's, um, required by the government to offer free care to survivors of Ebola. And they're, you know, they sound like the model survivors. Oh, when I was, after I was sick, I worked in the clinic and volunteered and gave people hope. And one of them stops and says, no, 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 he, this guy, when he got sick, which was fairly early in the epidemic, he, they put him in a holding center and he ran, he got in a cab and he left town and they had to follow him and apprehend him and bring him back. And he was embarrassed and I didn't say anything. And he said, you have to understand I was getting WhatsApp messages about what they were doing to body parts and how they people were just dying and 
my family wouldn't know where I was and it was just going to be like this massive whatever. And, you know, it changed over time because the care got better. But if you're going into the, if you want to convince people to come into the health center to get treated, it can't, they can't be assuming that they're going to die or have their body parts taken or be crowded in a room with other sick people. There were more people getting sick in the holding centers than they were getting, than they were recovering at the time. So, I mean, this is a long-winded way to say it is very difficult for, um, in, in, or like even here, so the U.S. is another example. It's not just about the care, but about the cost. So if you think that you're going to be stuck with a $50,000, $100,000 bill, you think twice about how sick you are and whether it's worth going. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's, um, and add the police or add the military or this idea of enforcement to it. And it, I think it becomes, care does not seem like a possibility. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, that, that's, that's just, I would say that's generally the problem that we were having. Right. I mean, it's, it's really amazing how much what you're sharing with us resonates in historical research as well, right? Like, so we have an exhibit on the Bombay plague in which the artist has gone and done historical research and has, you know, picked out um, cartoons from uh, the magazine, caricatures, uh, responses by people, um, popular responses, etc. And many of the drawings and the cartoons that you showed us, actually, every time I saw one, I was like, oh, wait, that's in there, right? Like, so this is Randit Kandil Gaukar's drawing the Bombay plague. Um, it would be lovely if, if, you know, if you had a moment to look at it afterwards. Because it's it's just absolutely amazing how the, how much this resonates with you know the fear of I don't want to be taken to the care center I have no idea what they're doing to people at the care center are they going to take it? and and you know while it has it has kernels of um, genuine doubt there's a lot of stuff around it which one cannot sort of you know penetrate through and and um, the messaging is somehow lost and and you know that that's what reestablishes the idea that public health is so much more. Then you know, uh, then then medicine, um, you know, as if you know, one, one, and of course you have an MPH, and you know, you've made you you've made you you've sort of you know developed your career on uh, you know using uh, your training, understanding what really happens in these situations. So I I have um, a question from Leanne, which uh, you know takes um, takes. This and probably this was among the points that you weren't able to raise today, which is how uh, could you speak more to what defines a crisis or what the designation of crisis means and does in the situation of an epidemic? Now, while an epidemic by definition is taken to be a crisis, is there, you know, in a sense, while this word is mobilized, is there another way that you would look at it given your own research? Right? Like, how would you, how would you? Yes. Yeah. That is a great question. It's it's funny. I was, I wonder if I can. Rem my brain is sort of cloudy this morning. Um, <laughs> but I had, um, I had written down a quote about crisis because I, you know, I'm still writing this book that just won't go away. And and um, Warwick Anderson actually wrote a really nice piece a couple a few months ago um, for people who don't know. He's a historian of science who works in the Philippines. Uh, and Australia. Um, and one of the, the things he talks about is sort of crisis as the decision point. You know, there's a, a, a it, that's essentially what it is. It's, it's the time that you're making a decision, but there are also people who talk about crisis um, being deployed and mobilized um, in a way that reproduces, um, violence or something like I can't, you know, I'm sort of like losing all the threads, but basically I think um, the, the crisis formulation is always a political one. Um, and I think it does, it makes certain kinds of exceptionalism possible and necessary. Um, it, I, I think it rarely summons care. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still trying to figure out why, <laughs> but I think a lot of it is about the, the, the kinds of decisions that crisis is supposed to, to index. So it's, it's, it's a decision about distribution. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, 
it's a, a decision about uh, capital. Mm. And I think that framing, um, is I think it I'm, I'm, it, I'm trying to think of whether, I'm actually trying to imagine crisis as good, <laughs> like a, a sort of, as, a, as, a, as having a, a good flip side. Um, but, but right now when I hear crisis, it is about um, some people being willing to um, abandon, abandon certain kinds of, of of, of decision-making ability and power. Um, and I think it depends on who de 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 declares the crisis, defines the crisis as well. Um, so if the US government, for example, is defining the crisis, I worry because the crisis often means, um, it means, uh, it often means violence um, and it often means violence against groups that are already marginalized. And it often means making decisions around relationships of scarcity. So if the crisis point is we need more vaccines and bodies, it, it necessitated hoarding. Hmm. Really, we, 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 we stockpiled, <laughs> we, we stockpiled things that we would not even use. Crisis in Chicago yeah. meant the police came out and could be and could act with as much discretion as possible. It meant that they closed the bridges to the city so that people who were in the city would be stuck there and people who, who were outside of it couldn't enter. Hmm. That's what crisis looked like. That's what crisis felt like. That's what crisis distributed in this time. Now, I think that some other people's crises, crisis, a crisis in a, in a trauma center after many gunshot wounds, it's a very different uh, situation. It's, but it's still about triage. It's still about prioritizing. Yeah. And yeah, yeah and whatever logics dictate the triage, dictate, the, dictate the, the outcome and the consequences. And they're not always good for the people who are never the priority. Hmm. So in this context, and you know, uh, uh, sort of in a way, looking back at your work on AIDS, but also um, more recent observations uh, about Ebola, how do what what are your observations, and how do you, in a way, grasp the people's understanding of cure, right? Mm -hmm. Or what? Yeah. So. Uh, it, there's a there's a different alphabet here from care to cure. Yes. But in many ways, the expectations of care are also of you know being able to overcome. Um, right. Disease. So how that's how that... <laughs> so that's that that's actually excellent. And it's a thing I wanted to talk about and actually forgot about, um, which is how difficult it is to think AIDS and Ebola together, because AIDS is sort of seen as, oh it's chronic, once you get this drug, this will happen. And now there's actually um, more discussion of vaccines now that mRNA vaccines are less mm -hmm. experimental, I guess. Um, and there are a few instances of cure through bone marrow um, transplants and things like that. So, um, but the idea that you can kind of live a long life being treated is a very different thing from Ebola where survivorship is, oh, you cleared the infection and now you're okay. Um, the, <laughs> it changes, so people are kind of thinking in the short, short term for Ebola, or at least they were, oh, let's isolate, contain, if they die, whatever, you know, like there, that was actually the logic that first drove how the intervention looked. But here's the thing, when you have 10, 15,000 people who survived Ebola and, you know, a tenth of them continue to experience symptoms after they've been cured. Mm -hmm. And now, I don't know if anyone knows this, but we have this infection that happened in Guinea that set off a few more infections this year um, of Ebola. We have a new, it, I think the, the outbreak is almost close to being declared over, but when they did the sort of gene genomic sequencing, they discovered, oh, these new cases are actually linked to this guy who was cured five years ago. 
that has implications, I think, you know, and so, and, and so I guess the way that I'm thinking about it is the expectation of cure changes the logic of prevention and treatment. So mm-hmm. containment, isolation, all of this is a really, feels like a really nice intervention when you know that, oh, if you can just wait it out 21 days, oh, if you can just, if you can just, um, get, if we can just get you through this, everything will be fine. It, it kind of has a different sort of logic. Uh, the potential for cure, the potential for complete prevention shapes all the stuff down the line. Now we're seeing long COVID. We're seeing people who were otherwise healthy until they got that infection, struggling for months, years. We're now going into a year. It it changes the whole, the way that we're thinking about um, the logics of prevention, of treatment, of of even the imagination of cure. Um, It has some scientific and I think economic uh, implications down the line, which is, do you then devote a lot of effort to cure? What does cure mean and look like? Is it simply the absence of pathogen in the body? Is, or is it about the symptoms that persist as a result of that infection? Um, what does it mean for people who now have chronic conditions? The, t- the time scales, the, the, again, that's why I said that when we talk about d- diagnosis, detection, investigation, it's all to the end of an intervention and the intervention changes once the placement of the problem changes. Hmm. Um, the, the diagnosis changes <laughs> as, as the, the temporality of effects changes. Um, yeah, in fact, so we had, a, we had a, another historian of medicine, probably a colleague of yours, uh, who you're aware of, Dora Varga, Mm. who spoke about polio in Cold War Hungary and had a very similar uh, take on it as to, you know, when, when does a pandemic end and who does it end for and when do we declare it, declare it as over or what is that end point and how that shifts in a sense, you know, through the experience of the pandemic itself or the epidemic for that matter. Uh, we have probably a friend of yours here, Jane Cooper, who, who thanks you and says that was a brilliant, as brilliant as I expected. Um, yeah. And what she is asking you about is the emotional labor or the service performed by uh, marginalized groups in allowing authorities to escape blame and more privileged groups to manage their fear. How do you see this? Wow. Okay, Jane. Hi, Jane. I'm assuming you're still in France. <laughs> Jane and I go way back. Um, so uh, I, I'm wondering if, um, so I'm, when I see marginalized um, allowing the authorities to escape blame, I'm wondering what that could mean. Um, I, I can think about, um, oh, I see. I think it means taking up a lot of the responsibility. So us step, us step, like what happens when communities step in when authorities fail to. Um, I think that's, I actually think that's the norm. Uh, But I also think that, and and I think that's part of our, that's part of what we're dealing with with neoliberalism. You know, actually one of the things I, that struck me a few weeks ago um, with my friends who have family in India was the number of folks who were saying, my auntie needs oxygen. It was a tweet, like these are tweets. Um, and I ca- and I was like, how is it that we're in this situation where we're tr- like, I don't know, it just, it, it, bo- it was mind boggling to me that we could be thinking about that, that, that families are searching for oxygen for, for their loved ones who are sick. Um, but in fact, that is, I feel like that is the norm. Um, and it, and a lot of it's a, a kind of, symptom of this broader system of of abandonment and of austerity and the receding of of state welfare at least thinking of of care as a social good um, that Mm -hmm. is that is shoulder partly shouldered by the state Um, again i was 
I also use the example of, of Chicago where I received, so when we were having all of the protests around Black Lives, Black Lives Matter um, and police violence in Chicago, the mayor sent out, the mayor's office sent out multiple text messages about, okay, there's a curfew, everyone needs to get home. Of course it happened after the curfew. We got the text messages after the curfew had begun, which felt like a trap. But one of the things, but I also felt like I have not received a single text message about where I could get a COVID test. Hmm. I did not receive a single message that said, wear a mask or we are now running buses at lower capacity more frequently. I did not receive messages about services. Hmm. I did receive multiple messages about punishment warnings of violence right from by the state or the threat essentially an implied threat of violence by my city government yep. and so yes they I, I would say we this was a, a moment and an opportunity for us to also hold authorities responsible but i think we've been in the position of of having to offer care um well before our our authorities did um, that includes the people who were making lists of everyone in their communities who needed their groceries delivered, who needed to be checked on, um, who needed to be possibly taken to get a test, to vote, everything, right? So these were, this, this all of this stuff became um, clear. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. It was implied before, but it was made explicit when we were faced with this large scale I'll call it a crisis, large scale crisis of public health and healthcare. Yep. I think, um, you know, I think you very aptly described how an observation that, you know, we, that um, scholars have been making also in India as to how a pandemic situation, both in colonial India or imperial India and today looks like a law and order situation rather than a public health emergency, right? And so that, that kind of gets reflected in what messaging is prioritized, what, um, what you know, and, and in what manner those um, decisions are also implemented, right? And which is your, uh, I, I really like the way you said the epidemic will be militarized. I mean, it's, it's um, yes. So, you know, it's, 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 it, it's probably not militarized to the same extent as, uh, you know, in every location, but that it's policed most certainly, and that there must be a better adjective to use to kind of uh, ca capture the word militarized. But I think the uh, what you capture there is really what's happening. Essentially, it is about law and order. It is about the promise of state violence in retaliation, and um, where the as as one of the commentators said, where the bodies of the citizenry or the bodies of the polity uh, become the equivalent of enemy body. Right, um, and and that's it's it's also the same metaphors with which we see pandemics, which is that of a situation of war. Viruses need to be eliminated; they need to be defeated. The situation needs to come back to peace, etc. I'll ask the last question, which is from Francesca Forrest, who's interested in, I think, probably a sentence that came up in your presentation: "Any question is interpreted as resistance." Because she thinks we see this often in just day-to-day -day care too, in spite of the contrary messages that people should be more active in their own care. Is there more you could say to this? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I think this is actually true. I think, yes, it becomes a, I think it's amplified in these situations. And I think, you know, I, I kind of want to tap, kind of go back to the policing military. I actually started to, to kind of fall away from the militarization angle because I think policing is actually the more, um, some people talk call it like martial politics so it can be a little bit more sort of expansive and the law and order, it covers that law and order piece, that threat of violence is a part as an organizing logic um, for the action. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about is how it, that's why I was also talking about detection and investigation is sort of like active public health surveillance is just like beat cop work. It's the guy who patrols the street, 
Whereas the detective kind of goes, oh, who done it? Like, where's the virus and how can we, all for the sake of essentially sort of criminalizing, if it's criminalizing the virus, the virus is living in the body, you are essentially in de facto <laughs> criminalizing populations. They're hosting a criminal. They're hosting the criminal. They're harboring, they're accomplices essentially, right? Um, <laughs> and that's sort of what it looks like if you look at the whiteboard of the investigation. Um, which get, leads me to that, to answer that question, which was, I, you know, one of the things that I was trying to kind of tease out when I was doing this military security police martial politics work on, uh, with respect to the Ebola outbreak was saying, wait a second, this was always already uh, securitized. Hmm. It's there. Um, it's, and it's certainly a part of clinical and public health work. Um, which is why the, the, when care is actually instituted and implemented in ways that are experienced as care, <laughs> that's like a, you know, that it feels revolutionary. It feels radical. Um, and so, yes, I would say um, it, it, this, the, the context here was, again, once people start, the context here was, clinicians and health workers were imperiled because of their involvement with this Ebola stuff. And their first instinct was to recognize the people that they were encountering as potential host hostile witnesses, potential hostile subjects. And so when you enter a relationship of presumably of care <laughs> with hostility, um, it, or with the expectation of hostility, the fear of hostility, actually. Mm -hmm. I think it's very easy for that clip, for any kind of questioning, any sort of, any, any um, op perceived opposition at, you're looking for signs of, you're always primed for signs of, of, of resistance and you will find it. Um, I don't know if I can really add more to that, except to say is this was a situation primed for that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, there was nothing to suggest to many of these people that folks entering the village, folks entering the community had their best interests at heart. Their interest was to keep, to contain the problem. Mm -hmm. And containing the problem meant containing these people yep. on the terms of the folks looking to do the containing. Yep. Thank you so much, Adia, for engaging so generously with the questions. I mean, I, uh, you know, we all we have all enjoyed your lecture, uh, but I think we've really sort of seen your generosity come through in the way you engaged with the questions. For those of you who would like to share this lecture and other lectures in the series with people, uh, with other people who you think might be interested, the lecture will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, as will be um, our other 22 lectures. So please do um, go to the YouTube channel, have a look at the other lectures and do share them with people who will be interested in learning more about how different geographies or different places and different times often show up very similar human responses to a pandemic or an epidemic. I trust you have um, enjoyed the lecture. And so we also suggest that you might actually want to look at Fluid Dialogues, an exhibit in, in, uh, in this season by Basish Titkin, uh, together with Jayashree T, um, who's a filmmaker from Bangalore, who explores the stigma around HIV AIDS specifically, but infectious diseases um, in general. More relevant, do consider watching the film Survivors by Arthur Pratt, which is showing as a part of Contagion. It's available to watch on our website until the end of the exhibition. The film explores the lives of frontline workers and community members during the outbreak of Ebola in Sierra Leone in 2014. And we have a recording of a discussion between Arthur Pratt and the epidemiologist David Heyman, who was a part of the first team that um, landed um, in, uh, 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 you know, at the outbreak of uh, Ebola. Uh, do consider signing up for a panel discussion between our academic advisor and historian of medicine, Sandra Bhattacharya. 
and the health systems researcher say Adimbola and researcher uh, Sharifa Sekalala, they will be speaking about human rights and knowledge during crises on Friday 11 June at 2 p.m., a topic that speaks very directly to what Adia has been speaking about this evening. Do please give us your feedback. Do please visit the website for the exhibition and come back again to the rest of the program. Thank you again, Adia, for taking time to be with us your morning, our evening, um, and uh, look forward to future engagements with you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.